All right, I've been marking exam papers all day, so I'm battered, my brain is mush, so let's talk about something interesting and brief. Subclavian steel syndrome. What is a subclavian steel? So subclavian steel sounds fascinating, and uh, yeah, anatomically it's cool. Um, this was taught to me by Clive Weston some years ago, so a bit of legacy here, Clive. Um, my main aim for talking about a subclavian steel is to cement some head and neck anatomy into your head so you will remember some stuff more easily. You'll see what I mean as we go. So we'll talk about what a subclavian steel is, we'll talk a little bit of you know, the signs and symptoms and how it can occur, but we'll focus on the relevant anatomy. And subclavian, it's a cardiovascular thing. A subclavian steel describes a subclavian artery stealing blood from the brain. Can you think how yet? Have you? You start to work out what's going on here. It's not clear how common this is because uh, many people are asymptomatic and it only gets noticed when um, you start looking at the cardiovascular system in the upper thorax and the neck and that sort of thing. Um, the main way it can be detected is that the blood pressure measurements in the two arms are different in the left and right. Now. Um, Symptoms that somebody might experience would be classically claudication of typically the left arm. I think the, the, it, it occurs more often on the left side, like 80%, 20%. And claudication means getting pins and needles in your limb, particularly when you're doing upper limb activities, upper limb exercise. So as the muscles, muscles of the upper limb are trying to draw more blood into them, they fail to do so effectively and you start getting pins and needles and white patches and, and that sort of thing. Um, the thing is there can also be some neurological signs as well, presyncope, so with movement of your upper limbs a sensation that you're about to faint, or syncope, actual fainting, or a myriad of other neuro um, symptoms, you know, like vertigo, um, you know, dizziness, or visual effects, or all sorts of things. Why? Here is most of the relevant anatomy. Okay, so this is the right side, we haven't got the left on here, but we've got, in this case, from the arch of the aorta, you've got the brachiocephalic trunk, and then we've got the right subclavian artery here, becoming the axillary artery and so on, and we've got the common carotid artery running up there. Now, do you see that? This artery here is a branch of the subclavian artery, and this artery is a vertebral artery. And the same thing happens on both sides. So the left subclavian artery is a direct branch from the aorta, we'll have a look in a moment. Uh, and it also sends off a vertebral artery up here. So the two vertebral arteries run up through the neck within right next to the cervical vertebrae and then they meet. So they pass through the foramen magnum and they go into the, into the skull and they join to form the basilar artery. Here's a brain. This is probably going to fall apart if I turn it upside down. But ooh, there's the brain taken out of the skull, so we've got the brain stem here. Here's the basilar artery, and these are the two vertebral arteries coming up. So the two vertebral arteries are supplying blood to the brain, um, and the internal carotid arteries are the other two arteries supplying blood to the brain. They all join up a little bit in the circle of Willis. There's another video on that. Okay, so there, there, there's a bit of, bit of a clue. Now, so build up the image in your head. You've got your right subclavian artery running off here, and it's sending off a vertebral artery up to the brain, and it meets the other vertebral artery at the basilar artery. On the left hand side, there's the subclavian artery here. This is going to go out and supply blood to the left upper limb. 
and that's sending off the left vertebral artery. So they both, they both meet up at the top. Now, this subclavian steel is more common in men than women. Um, was it about two to one ratio, something like that? It seems to be associated with other cardiovascular risk factors um, like smoking, hypertension, diabetes, all that sort of stuff. And the most common cause is atherosclerosis. So a narrowing of an artery. And in this case, it's a narrowing of the first part of the left subclavian artery. So this has narrowed, which means that when you exercise the muscles of the left upper limb and they try to draw more blood through the left subclavian artery, they struggle to do so because there's a stenosis here, there's a narrowing. So what happens? Well, now the right subclavian artery is sending blood up to the brain through the right vertebral artery. But that blood, as it goes up to the right vertebral artery, goes, and it meets at the basilar artery, can get pulled down. You can get a reversal of flow. So the blood passes down the left vertebral artery and into the left subclavian artery, and then gets pulled into the left upper limb. That's unexpected. And that's the subclavian steel. So at this point, we've got essentially an anastomosis here, linking up two blood vessels, supplying the left upper limb with the extra blood that it needs. But that means there's a risk of not enough blood getting to the brain, which is why you might get those neurological signs, particularly pre-syncope and syncope, uh, a feeling like you're about to faint. Isn't that an interesting bit of anatomy? So subclavian steel syndrome is caused by a narrowing of the subclavian artery in its proximal part, in its first part, most commonly on the left side, meaning that it, it's harder for the upper limb to draw blood into it. Because the two subclavian arteries are joined by their vertebral arteries that meet at the basilar artery, it's possible to reverse the direction of flow. And instead of blood going to the brain, it goes back down to the limb. Simple bit of anatomy when you know about it. Anywho, that's it. Nice and brief. Makes a change, doesn't it? Right, see you guys next week. Bye.